Hello, and welcome to this introductory video on the topic of momentum conservation. To motivate this, let's just think about all the things that we've done so far in thinking about momentum and impulse. And all of those things have built upon Newton's second law. So we took this very simplistic F equals MA, and we realized we could manipulate it a bit and come up with things like quantity of momentum, the idea of momentum, the quantity impulse, and even find relationships between impulse and momentum, then therefore really and truly completely characterize how these interactions between objects change the motion of objects. But unfortunately, we've basically taken Newton's second law as far as we can. Of course, Newton was kind enough to give us a third law as well. So if we think about Newton's third law, well, then we actually open up a whole new realm of possibility. So remember, Newton's third law, again, just like Newton's second law, seems to be fairly straightforward. It's just saying that the force by object 2 on object 1 is the opposite of the force by object 1 on object 2. Now, let's go ahead and use our information from Newton's second law and the fact that we know what momentum is, and we can write F equals MA as F equals dP dt, and apply it to this situation, then we've got that the time rate of change of the momentum of object 1 is equal to the time rate of change of the momentum of object 2. And what this is saying is, because we're talking about an interaction between object 1 and object 2, which clearly must last for the same amount of time, that is to say, time that object 1 interacts with object 2 must be the same as the time that object 2 interacts with object 1. Since those times are the same, we can integrate this relationship over that time period, and we'll just get the overall change in momenta of the two objects. So the change in momentum of object 1 is equal and opposite to the change in momentum of object 2. So what then does this mean? Well, it means that for any interaction of two objects, we can write down very straightforwardly that the change in the total momentum, so if we sum the momentum of object 1 with the momentum of object 2, that total change is going to be 0. And that is a very important statement. It says, in an interaction between two objects, the total momentum is always conserved. There is no change. The sum of momenta will always be the same. And that's in any interaction. We haven't talked about the specifics. We haven't said, is there any deformation of the object? None of that information has been included. We're just saying, just by Newton's third law, regardless of how, once we're applying those forces, they're going to be equal and opposite the whole way through, which means they're going to cause equal and opposite changes in momenta, and therefore momentum will always be conserved. So that's a very powerful statement and provides a wonderful tool for solving problems. So let's explore how we use this. So what that statement is, the sum of the momenta of the two objects initially is equal to the sum of the momenta of the two objects after some interaction. So let's think about an interaction. Let's suppose that we've got mass 1 and mass 2 over here. They're going to move together and collide. When they collide, we've got their initial velocities, but now they're going to exchange momenta because there's going to be this interaction via forces that they exert on each other. And so they'll acquire some new velocities instead of these initial ones, and then they'll move apart. And what the conservation of momentum allows us to do is to immediately write down a relationship between those initial velocities and the final ones, according to this expression down here. And all we've done, really, is to put in the actual definition of what momentum represents. Remember, p is just m times v. So from this, if we knew any three of the velocities, we would be able to predict the fourth one. Now, in a collision, more can happen. We don't have to actually um, move apart separately. These objects could stick together. And if they do that, well, then again, they'll have collided with these initial velocities, v1 initial and v2 initial. But then they'll stick together into some new blob and move off together with some new velocity, which we'll call v12. 
So they'll just move off together as shown. And here again, because we didn't care about any deformation occurring, we just looked at the forces. We don't need to know anything more about the situation. We know immediately momentum is conserved. So we can write that down. And what that just says is now the sum of the initial momenta becomes the momentum of this new amalgamated object that consists of a mass, effective mass, of m1 plus m2. And again, knowing the two initial velocities allows us to predict exactly what that final velocity would be. So this seems a really powerful and really simple tool. But in fact, there is one caveat to raise. So let's suppose that we're thinking about this collision of the balls, but we're not thinking about them just in the vacuum of space, but they're actually near the Earth. So if they're sitting here near the Earth, then as they're colliding, there's still gravity from the Earth pulling down on these two balls. So when they collide, and we try to say m1 v1 plus m2 v2 initially is the same, is equal to m1 v1 plus m2 v2 after the collision, we're going to be wrong because there's been this change from the fact that gravity has also been accelerating the balls the whole time. So in order to deal with this, we realize that there's some sort of external interaction. If we're just thinking about the balls together, then there's this force coming from outside of our system, and that force is messing things up with momentum conservation. So we really have to focus in on this idea of defining a system. So what I mean by that is if we think of a system which only is talking about what's going on with these objects, the original masses, then there was this external force of gravity acting. When they collide, the forces are exerted inside our system. But when we are thinking about the Earth the whole time, the Earth is sitting out here and there's this force coming out of our system. And that force is acting externally and it's changing the motion that we would have expected had it not been present. So we can, of course, be a bit clever about this and draw a new system, which just includes everything. And then all of a sudden, the force is inside our system. And we can also think about the gravitational force that this exerts on the Earth, and that's still inside the system. And so, inside our new big system anyway, so for this new big system, all these things are inside. There's going to be an exchange of momentum here, an exchange of momentum according to this, but all that's inside. And so that will again balance out. So when we're thinking about momentum conservation, we have to think carefully about what system we've chosen. And so whenever we've got these larger systems of many bodies, we have to make sure that if we want to apply the idea of momentum conservation, that we've chosen our system to be big enough, basically, to include every interaction that's actually occurring. Another way of saying that is that there should be no external force.